Welcome back to Knowledge Drop, a podcast where we talk about science, technology, and engineering. I'm Derek. And I'm Sarah. Hey, we've got another guest on the show today. Um, Sarah and I also took a class together, two classes together. Um, But Sarah, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. Um, So I'm Sarah. I am a mechanical engineering with energy environment focus major at ASU in my third year, I guess second year after transferring here. Um, I am from New York. Uh, No, that's good. That's about all I got. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny. um, Everyone that I talk to right now for like where we're at in classes they're always like i'm a junior because it sounds fun to say that i'm a junior but i'm still taking sophomore classes (laughs) yeah (laughs) so i'm i'm in that boat as well um but yeah we uh we took dynamics this semester which well i still can't believe i passed that class but uh it it was good i know like (laughs) learned a lot of things and yeah can exhale finally um And so as we do with every show, we're going to do a fun fact. And this one, I actually had to do the math on because I didn't believe it when I heard it. So fun fact for today, the distance between the Earth and the moon is almost the same distance as if you could stack all the planets in between. Oh, I think I've heard that before. So like you can take all the planets and line them up end to end. And you'll have just enough room between the earth and the moon. Um, But I have to clarify the, the moon doesn't have a constant distance from earth. And so there's like a word they use is apogee. Yeah. So at its apogee, the high, the furthest distance from earth, it's uh, 252,000 miles. And all of the planets inside of that distance is 244,000 miles which wow. still is bonkers to me to think that all of the planets could possibly fit just in our little Earth to Moon. <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, I thought that was cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Like, yeah, that's cool. I don't know. The vastness People of travel space. travel that distance, like, <laughs> yeah. to go stay on the moon and just thinking, like, that travel distance, you, like, you could have gone past every planet. Yeah, but, yeah. I don't know, so. Um, so today, we're going to learn not so much about a concept or specific thing but about a problem that's happening and something um so i was actually involved with this a little bit not directly with sarah (laughs) but there's a program at asu called epics and it's short for engineering projects in community service right yes and um the whole program is kind of built around you know engineering students i guess it's not even just engineering students it's anybody can join that right yeah, yeah. Um, I have a computer science major that's in yeah. my group right now. Um, I'm sure there's probably some mathematicians that join every once in a while. And stuff. Yeah, but so it, like more it's, the people in the STEM that hear about it. Yeah, I, I think it, it is geared more towards the hands on STEM majors. But basically, mm. you kind of form your own little team and tackle an issue um, sometimes for years and sometimes for just a you know, a semester or two. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really nice. You know, you get to actually experience what some engineering project would be like. Yeah. So, you know, freshman year going into school. um, I don't know if anyone besides ASU offers this, but, um, you know, you can figure out if you actually want to do engineering or not, because it's very, very similar. Like it's a smaller scale project, but you're still going through the process. Yeah, absolutely. Because I I know a lot of people, they're like, it sounds cool, but I don't know if they're prepared for what it actually is. Because, mm-hmm. you know, uh, aerospace engineering sounds really cool, but man, is it a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, um, kudos to the in aerospace engineer. Oh, yeah, it double. It always sounds so painful. <laughs> yeah, my one of my friends is an aerospace engineering student he tells me all the time like how much code he has to write for MATLAB and I'm like, oh, go. <laughs> So yeah, um, that's the EPICS program. And you've been in it two semesters now, right? Yes, two semesters. Okay. And I that's do- how I met Derek. Was yes. So Epic. originally, <laughs> so this was my first semester in EPICS. And how it's supposed to go is you kind of come into the program 
and you look at all the program, all the projects that are available and you kind of, this is where I get kind of mixed up because it didn't really happen that way for me, but you kind of pick the projects that you think would be really fun to be involved in. And then there's a lottery, I guess, or something. Yeah. So I didn't get any of my picks. (laughs) Oh no. Um, So normally um, you'd pick a group. So like basically we'd all be in the room, you know, you'd have separate groups at each table and you could walk around, Mm -hmm. talk to the group members. They'd tell you about their project and, you know, let you know what spaces they have available. And usually each team will have ready, like, oh, you know, this major would be really helpful if any one that's like specifically doing that major like mm-hmm. we want you on our team if you're interested um so normally you'd go around you'd pick what group you want to go on and you'd be a part of that group um but this past semester um because i think it was just because of covid maybe people having like more free time or just i don't know <laughs> word of mouth everybody learning about it <laughs> Um, epic numbers like people enrolled in the epics class I think numbers like doubled they skyrocketed really like, it was huge wow, I didn't know amount. that oh, yeah so that's why they actually had to have you pick like your top your top groups to be in uh, because that makes you sense. know they had way more students than they were ever expecting to have but yeah normally you get your pick yeah, so that's the the end of my story is that <clears throat> I had a, a bunch of projects. I was like, man, this is so cool. And um, I put them on my list, top three, top four, whatever it was. And then I didn't get any of them. And I had, yeah. I think I had like a backup or something. It must have been number four that I put. But I, I got that one and I was like, okay, this should be good. And then it, <laughs> yeah, it, it was a good experience. I just, I don't know if I'll uh, do epics again. But not that's not me saying it's bad. It's a it's an awesome program. All the we'll teachers were great. We'll try you on our team. Yes, yeah, that would be preferable. <laughs> so good segue. Tell us about your team. Oh, okay. So so my team is a little different. Um, we're actually a student started project. Normally, the way it works is someone in the like Arizona Tempe area community. They might have a business and they have some issue they want you to solve. So they'll actually propose it to Arizona State, Mm -hmm. um, like the heads of the EPICS program. They'll decide, oh, you know, this would be a great project for our students. Mm -hmm. So um, that'll be a new group for everyone to try to join onto. And you'll be actively like talking to your community partner and working with your AA, which AA is academic advisor. Yeah. Not the other AA. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we just automatically assume all the students are going to need that after this yeah, project. I mean, engineering's <laughs> rough. I don't blame them, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're usually working hands-on. You don't have to like get that basis started off. But my group um, was started by our team lead, who is Shami or Shamsher. Uh, if anyone is at ASU, which I assume a lot of the viewers are at ASU um, or listeners, listeners More. yeah i <laughs> i just get general you know uh not feedback but uh statistics so i'm not 100 percent, but yes mostly in arizona yeah yeah so um if you ever go into ecg you might see shami in there because he works there so um, ecg is one of the buildings right on asu campus okay gotcha yeah one of the engineering buildings um so he was just doing research one day and he came up on this topic discussing you know different um cities around the world and their pollution levels with relation to like population and everything Mm -hmm. or just like which which um cities have the top specifically pm 2.5 which is a like microscopic um pollutant that's really harmful because it is so small it just gets into people's cells Mm -hmm. um so Anyways. Interesting. Yeah. So we have like a report from like 2018, top five. The fifth one is Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. The ones before that are New Delhi, India, Bangladesh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Yeah. So places we've heard of. Places we've heard of. Big population centers. Huge populations. Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia is number five, and it only has a population of about 1.4 million people. 
which you know it sounds like a lot but in relation to those other places significantly it's, lower it's tiny <laughs> tiny so part of the reason it has such a huge pollution rate is because it is located in the Tool River Valley which if you're looking at Mongolia which is the country between China and Russia uh -huh. um, so it's about just a little bit northeast of the center of the country okay um, so it's in this river valley it's a high pressure system and it gets really really cold winters so um, an issue that the nomadic people Mongolia were facing is suds which are just it's basically the term for really harsh winters mm -hmm. And so they have huge wipeouts of livestock. So people have been moving their yurts, which if you don't know what a yurt is, it's like it's like a portable cabin almost that's cloth on the outside. I don't know how to describe it. It's like a teepee, it. but you can it's more portable. Yeah. yeah, it's like a bigger version of a teepee. And it's yeah. meant to be able to move fairly easily. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what these people are living in, and so they're, they're all moving to the outskirts of Ulaanbaatar, the capital, you know, better job options, so they're all moving there, but all these people are burning coal in their stoves to keep them warm, cook their food during these horribly harsh winters, so a lot of times people have their stoves running 24-7. They'd mm -hmm. rather keep it running than let it turn off and have to put it back on or like light it back up again so oh, like starting the fire again and again yeah, oh, yeah exactly. that would get annoying so they'll just keep it they'll just keep it running 24 7 so it's huge huge pollution levels in this city um like horrible horrible detriment to people's health like you know there's certain areas of the gare district which gare is mongolian word for yurt so they actually had these specific districts. It's kind of like a slum district, I guess, in a sense. Mm -hmm. That um, makes sense. Yeah. So they, um, you know, there's been certain areas where they see like a, th oh, what is it? Like three times the normal rate of a, like natural, um, what's the word? Oh, miscarriages. Like you'll see mm -hmm. like three times the normal rate of miscarriages within certain wow. areas. And they relate it to horrible pollution levels. Pollution, pollution like related illness causing deaths is like second most common cause of childhood mortality in Mongolia. Nice. Um, yeah, no, it's so it's insane. so because it because of the physical location and what happens with the weather, it makes mm -hmm. it colder and colder every year because of climate change and things that are happening around this area. So because it yeah. keeps getting colder and colder, yeah. it's forcing these native people who normally roam around the country, they can't feed themselves because it's too cold, the livestock dies. Mm -hmm. So they move to the cities, they're all crowded in one place, they don't move anymore, and it's too cold. There's not enough resources, I'm guessing. There's not like housing. So they yeah, just stay so the, in the, the country is trying to work on getting um, like apartment buildings for people to be able to move in. Mm -hmm. um, the NGO that my group is working with, which if you don't know, it's NGO is like non government non governmental organization. Okay. Um, I didn't know they, that. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I didn't at first either. Um, <laughs> it's a knowledge drought. So, yeah. So the group we're working with, they actually. Um, work with a, they have about 500 housing units and they have like i don't i think they've actually moved them out of yurts they're more into like little little tiny like cabins in a sense mm -hmm. that they like manage and everything um but yeah so like i don't know it's it's a lot it's interesting <laughs> no that's that sounds like a huge problem though like just with the fact that it's it's actually ca causing death and harm to the people there but they mm -hmm. can't really do anything about it themselves because i'm assuming they're not very uh educated so they don't they can't like get a lot of jobs right because mm -hmm. yeah, they didn't have access to school right and Lots then poverty in that area yeah um, 
they make so like access something? materials is probably limited because it's the location there's probably not a lot of lumber right yeah there's not a lot of lumber and oh, coal is coal is the number one export of mongolia so like part of our issue with trying to combat this it's like well we can't just we can't figure out a way to basically destroy this major use of coal within their country you yeah know, i mean if you economy is totally gonna plummet if half the yeah if you take coal out there the money that's coming into the country just goes away it's a, yeah that's a that's a tough one yeah so you know per the issue it's you know they're creating all this pollution but if they get rid of this their country is going to suffer horribly from it mm-hmm. and it you know Pollution might not be their issue anymore, but like poverty, um, yeah, people starving to death because there's just no funding, no economy, no funding mm-hmm. within this country anymore. So, um, you know, one of our initial thoughts was like, oh, well, why don't you just get rid of coal burning stoves, just do electric? Um, but you know, then we were faced with that issue. You know, we can't just get rid of coal. We need to figure. Like we need to figure out a way around it in a sense, um, at least for now until so, like, like the country can them figure out. A, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, that's a lot of how it ends up happening with renewable energy. It seems, you know, nobody wants to just jump to fix everything. Yeah. It's a it, well, slow, it's risky process. Yeah. I mean, America, we have been doing renewables and stuff like that for a long time. And we're only just barely scratching the surface of, contributing to our grid right now um i'm gonna look it up really quick just so i i present good numbers um (laughs) but percentage of uh renewable energy in the u.s yeah it's only at 11 Mm percent and um if you go to so i know you'll like this i i always look at germany because germany to me is like amazing in this aspect germany as of last year, 52% of their energy was produced with renewable uh, means. Wow. That's, that's I think, so you know what I me. think I saw was something, oh, I was looking at stuff today. Um, something crazy is somewhere around like 80% is renewable in Scotland. They have a goal of being totally like net zero by 2045, I believe it was. Um, uh better than you thought as of 2019 they made 90 percent of their consumption with renewable there you go that sounds so easy for them to be like all right next year we're just gonna bump it up another 10 percent yeah pretty much (laughs) that's crazy (laughs) but yeah it's just it's funny that they're you would think that if we're gonna try and um take advantage of renewable we like america who has reportedly the most disposable income of any country would be able to do it a lot quicker <laughs> yeah. but um germany the the thing that shocks me too is the thing about germany is most of it is solar mm, mm-hmm. yeah like, it's they get some pretty good summer months oh um, sorry never mind but yeah i was gonna say i 75 percent of germany is is biomass so yeah forgive okay. me okay um i was gonna say i don't see them having quite enough sun to have that be such a reliable source for them um when i was in the netherlands there were huge wind um wind turbine yeah farms. that makes sense um, yeah i mean wind ears you get it anyways <laughs> <laughs> yes getting off topic but um, um but yeah so you know, we couldn't just do the removal of the coal stoves. And another issue with even if we wanted to do the electrical stoves and we thought it'd work is they have a horrible energy grid system. It is always going out, always. Mm-hmm. It's not reliable whatsoever. So it's like, we can't just have this horribly unreliable source of heat for these people when it's what, negative 40? A lot of the times in the winters there, mm. like right right now, I can check. Today, it is negative 26 degrees Celsius in Ulaanbaatar. Yeah. I've, um, I've lived in area, I've lived in Alaska, and I know what that feels like. It's not fun. Mm-hmm. It's not yeah, fun. I'm, I'm in New York, and it's not even close, but it's cold <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, especially for spending any amount of time in Arizona. Oh, that's, for sure. That's tough. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, you know, we went into other ideas. It was like filtration, you know, we've always seen like filtration. Wait, what do you mean? Um, like filtering the coal itself, essentially. Um, and just like washing the coal. Um, but mostly what we were finding is a lot of projects, you know, or a lot of these, um, cleaning systems, they're massive, you know, they're made for more, like industrial uh, scale. Yeah. Industrial scale, okay. like. And when you look at it, like the possibility of scaling it down to what we would want, mm -hmm. it's a little unfeasible just because of the equipment that's necessary for it. Okay. Like you need huge like chemical vats and everything um, to try and clean it in a sense. But um, it's yeah, interesting. So kinda, I've never heard of uh, like cleaning coal. Yeah. So it so cleaning coal is basically just like washing the extra coal dust off of it. Interesting. Um, so it burns a little cleaner. Because um, you just you know, want to burn the chunky parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. <laughs> I've never burn burned chunky parts. I've never burned coal before. Or is charcoal? No, charcoal is just. Yeah. No, I. I don't <laughs> think. I'm thinking of like charcoal briquettes, like when you're growing. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know the the country I don't know if I've ever... tried to make briquettes um and sell idea. them to the people to have mm -hmm. cleaner coal for them to burn and it just didn't work out i think you know the coal is just so cheap for them mm -hmm. um and you know when you're catering to people that are living in poverty any gonna, added like, cost is any added cost is like no go that's an a meal you don't get that week or something absolutely you know um so you know we uh, ended up discussing with a like an energy focused professor, I don't remember his name, um, at ASU on this topic. And he's like, oh, well, you know, you guys could look into, um, you know, converting the coal to liquid fuel. You know, that's what China does. They're using DME, um, which is demethylized ether, I believe. I gotta double check, it's been a while, I'm gonna look it up. Um, pretty sure it's dim oh dimethyl ether okay um which basically um if if you convert it over to a liquid fuel it's going to burn cleaner um you know you don't have all that dust that is coming up into the atmosphere and getting mm -hmm. into the suns and everything so we thought about that and it was just like oh we can't we can't convince a country to listen to these random kids from arizona <laughs> in the u.s oh, yeah be like hey change the way you do all your fuel for your country it'll be better for the environment like nobody's gonna do that right that's I kind mean, of an absurd yeah, I, expectation <laughs> so i don't i don't think it's that crazy but like if it was something that like hey we can cut your cost of fuel production by 50 percent and make it so that it's not as polluting, polluting 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 <laughs> If, right, if, right. if you were able to come to someone like that and not say pollute, but say polluting, <laughs> um, I feel like it would be reasonable to go for, but I'm assuming this DME process is very expensive. You know, that's the thing. Like we ended up not doing a bunch of research into it. Cause after I like proposed this idea to the group, everyone was kind of like, Oh, well that seems absurd. We're not going to go into it further. So, you know, a lot of times going through the ethics process, people come up with ideas and then focus changes and that idea never gets fully explored. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe that'll be something for me to do next semester. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. We have so many, oh my gosh, so much research. But anyways, um, well, so- I, So we have kind of a, a good idea of what the problem is. What, what are yeah. some of the like- proposed solutions because you mentioned like dme is maybe a potential thing to research in the future mm -hmm. but i know you guys were talking about something at the beginning of the semester that when i interviewed you guys i guess basically <laughs> to join the group you guys were telling me about um a cool almost mechanical solution maybe. right so um I don't remember exactly what that was what we are doing might have changed a little bit since then. oh i'm i'm sure 
Um, so, I might be remembering it wrong as well. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're focusing on right now is insulation and um, air filtration. So basically, you know, these yurts, most of the time, like the outer walls of it, there's no insulation there. It's like they'll add extra blankets to make it mm. warmer. Okay. But that's about all the insulation that these buildings have because, you know, they're meant to be able to just be brought down within like less than an hour and move to a new place. Gotcha. Like that's how it originally was. So what we're trying to do is research all these different um, insulations, what their E values are, R values are, um, which basically that's just E values, R values. Um, like how insulative it is? Yeah. Pretty much like okay. how good it is at keeping thermal heat like in a building or out of a building. Yeah, everything. I've seen that when buildings go up, they haven't like R13 or something on the, mm. the foam panels that they put up. So it makes right. sense. Yeah. So we've been researching into that. Um, there's actually a company in Arizona um, that we are planning on researching into more that is using basically just recycled materials to make their insulation um so just to try and be even more green and give them an option oh well sure. any waste you have you guys can use this you can make more insulation to help improve these homes mm -hmm. um so we're looking at that and then so uh, i have a question really quick yes. the so these yurts are supposed to be mobile yes are they still moving around the city or is they or do they kind of become a permanent structure so at this point, they're more permanent structures. Um, but they don't want to like improve the like quality of the. I guess that takes money I, then, because that yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's just okay, extra never improvements mind. that they have to make on their home, so um, just extra money that these people don't have. Yeah. Um, okay. So, yeah, so they're they're pretty permanent structures at this point. Um, if there was an opportunity to move, I'm sure some of them would. Like, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, at this point, they're permanent structures. Gotcha. So, so we're working on insulation focus, but then we're also discussing, um, solar power in a sense. Um, so it's not actually powering like any heating units. Um, the thing that we're working on, it's solar to power an air filtration device that can be placed within the home. Mm -hmm. um, because it's like where a lot of this pollution is so concentrated, you know, it's coming out of your stove. There's like a flume to sort of direct the smoke out of your yurt, but like there's plenty of coal ash that is still settling. And so it still gets in the, the home. Interesting. Right. And like, it's, you see it a lot um, where all these health effects are arising. It's mostly affecting women who are staying home and cooking mm -hmm. and the children of the families. So, um, what we're trying to do is we've just, I guess we've decided at this point, um, solar is better, um, our better option between that and wind. I think those were the two that we were looking at. Um, mm -hmm. there was discussion of, you know, because it's in a river valley, there is actually a river that runs through, like near the city, possibly mm -hmm. just using hydropower, but, um, the idea of like, getting it to all of those yurts because it's totally surrounding the city it was just too much infrastructure change i think was the thought of it so if we can get like a solar panel that helps power filtration devices for say like four yurts that are next to each other um and then any extra that they're not using we can char use it to charge like a battery or some, or some yeah. sort of fuel cell or something um so it can still be used later that's sort of the idea that we're going into right now. Um, we just got equipment in about a week and a half before the semester ended. So we haven't had much time to really work with the equipment, kind of get an idea of it um, and how it's going to work. But that is the new prototyping idea that we're going with. Um, we recently, well, we're hoping to get in an AQI sensor, which AQI is air quality index. So that's basically mm -hmm. the measurement for how much concentration of pollutants there is okay. um, within a certain area. Um, so, I mean, here I can, let me look at, I'll see what it is over in Arizona right now. 
That's cool. Yeah, I know that every once in a while they're like, "Hey, take the bus today," because there's you know bad pollution that day. But I, I never thought to like look up on the index that you're yeah, talking about so, for air quality. Yeah. So so the way the index is, it's it's something like so it goes from zero to five hundred. Um, anywhere within the zero to fifty range is healthy. You know, anyone uh, anyone's probably fine to go outside uh 50 to 100 it's something like uh anyone that's sensitive group anyone with any like respiratory issues um you know you shouldn't go outside today maybe the air quality is not as good um the next block which would be 100 to i think it goes to 200 i don't have this in front of me oh oh there it is okay i found it um <laughs> so okay so zero to 50 is good um, so satisfactory air quality, 51 to 100 is moderate. It's so is this like just general pollutants or is it like specific tour? Cause you mentioned, so this is just general. Okay. Cause you mentioned one specific at the start of the episode. It was PM 2.15. Yes. PM 2.5. 2.5. Yeah. Okay. So that... this is a general scale, okay. but it does affect, it's like applicable to each of the, um, okay. pollutants as far as I'm as far as I am aware. Gotcha. Anyways. Okay. Um, so yeah, 51 to 100, it's moderate. Um, for some pollutants, there may be a health concern, but it's like very, very small um, number of people like really bad respiratory issues, um, like extreme cases of asthma, like it's unhealthy for you to go outside. 101 to 150 is unhealthy for sensitive groups again. Um, 151 to 200 is unhealthy. Everyone gotcha. may, like any group may be susceptible to health effects from the pollution level outside. Um, 201 to 300, very unhealthy. Um, like health warnings of emergency conditions. Um, nobody should be outside. And then 300 plus is hazardous. Basically, it's a health alert. Everyone may experience more sister serious health effects. Um, so today in Tempe, it is 26. So it's good. Healthy. People can go outside. Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Um, Ulaanbaatar, it's changed throughout the day. At the beginning of today, it was about 370. Whoa. Yeah. Um, right now, it is 278. Still very, that's very still, unhealthy. Wow, yeah, I did not realize. And that's it was only in a certain. High. Yeah, it's only in a certain section. Like right now, there's another section of Ulaanbaatar that's at 426. Uh, yeah, yeah, that that like it's a. Uh, <laughs> so, I wonder compared to the other cities you mentioned, like <laughs> New Delphi and um, those other ones, I wonder what the daily. Uh, air quality index is like over there because i know you said those are some of the worst ones but that just sounds really bad like it yeah. like it's excessive um, like I, I can't remember the words you were using but like it's excessive or maybe not excessive um but like you should really shouldn't be outside at all yeah no uh new delhi india is at 298 today man that's still okay yeah i guess i just never really paid attention to like air quality <laughs> <laughs> um let's see so far this year um uh, it looks like the highest let's see i actually um it's really nice the aqi sensor that i have it um will tell you the whole year um but they'll also tell you the past like five years or so um, the past five years, the highest number I'm seeing on one day is 495. And you said it's out of 500? 500 is the so they, highest number that it goes. They're going to hit the limit there soon. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they already have at one point, but man, that's, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... <laughs> interesting, yeah. I'm going to have to learn a little bit more about this because... 
yeah, I don't know. It just seems like you, you always hear about global warming and like CO2 levels, but you'd never really hear about the, the actual pollutant side of it. So, right. Interesting. The so specific pollutants within the yeah. atmosphere and everything. So yeah, it's kind of crazy to look at it. And it's just mm-hmm. like, I, I had never thought about it either until this project and like seeing just how horribly unhealthy it can be in yeah. this area some days. It's, Kind and so you, along with the Epics project, you, I guess you and your team have formed a nonprofit or um, are not going yet. to? We are hoping to. Okay. Um, just because a lot of the um, sort of grants that you can apply for, mm-hmm. you have a better chance of receiving like like winning or like receiving the grants and any funding if you are already a nonprofit organization. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Um. So funding wise, it makes sense to us to sort of convert over. Mm-hmm. Um, and that way it'll be kind of an easier way for us to stay involved even after we graduate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we're working on that. We've already picked a name. It's going to be Greener Gares. Because um, like I said earlier, Gare is the Mongolian. The yurt, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I did so, remember that one. <laughs> um so next semester we're gonna try and put together a project um website at least to start off so people can go there afterwards to get more information Mm -hmm. on our project um and keep yeah when you when you guys make that website um share it with me and i'll i'll put it in the uh on our social media and blast it out to people in the comments and stuff so awesome yeah, no. I'm, so I'm assuming more support can... would be awesome to get more information too. <laughs> yeah, of course. And you know, we're always open to like hearing more ideas. Like anyone like that hears this and they're like, oh, you know, I've heard of this method of energy yeah. generation that I think Absolutely. based on what you've said, like this would work great for this country. Like we would love to hear that stuff because this is an active project. We're always like mm-hmm. we're in the prototyping phase. Like we're always open to suggestion. Yeah. So just reach out to us at the knowledge drop podcast and I'll uh, get in touch with Sarah and you guys, or I'll put Sarah in contact with uh, whoever uh, presents an idea. Cause yeah, that would, I'm sure that'd be super helpful getting, getting a bunch of different ideas. Yeah, exactly. Anything we can do like, no, absolutely. Like even just, just even if we don't solve the bit. problem, yeah. Just making it a little bit more, not like totally hazardous to walk outside. Right. And I'm, I'm sure for you, someone like with a little baby, yes. like it's like, <laughs> like it's so sad to hear all these people that are like losing their children so young yes. just because of like the pollution levels in so this area that, you know, they're so poor, they can't move out of them. Mm-hmm. You know, like I was reading this report at one point, um, they were discussing with this woman, how she's trying to like reduce the pollution that's getting to her children basically like Mm -hmm. she almost lost one of them due to um respiratory issues um a couple years ago and she was like you know i i give them masks to go out and try and reduce the number of pollutants they're breathing in like it's a clean mask they go out they come back and the inside is all black from all this coal pollutant that they're breathing in all day long um and you know we've heard accounts from like doctors you know babies that are born like moments later they have already contracted like pneumonia because of oh my goodness in the atmosphere yeah like not even that much time has passed and they're sick yes precisely man well that's also you know that's why like a abor- like um spontaneous abortion rates mm-hmm. are so high um yeah it's i remember you mentioning a fetus that fetus cannot survive with that level of pollutant within their system already yeah, that totally makes sense. Now, when you mentioned it, I was like, how do, how can they correlate that with pollution? But no, that totally makes sense now that like you, I understand a little bit more about air indexes and stuff like that. that like that gets into your body and that whatever's in your body is going to be passed to that unborn child and mm-hmm. it's going to mess them up. That's so. Yeah. And I mean, like horrible. I was saying, the PM 2.1, PM 2.5, it's on it can go through cell walls like it's so small yeah yeah. so it's just seeping into your body already well 
I'm glad there's somebody that is aware of it and is trying to to uh, alleviate this because yeah this is a that's a problem yeah it's um, I just anything we can do honestly like and also if anyone's interested in epics I highly encourage you to join um I've only done it for two semesters now but I love mm -hmm. it and you know usually we have groups of six typically mm -hmm. um and we have we will have five members i believe next semester yeah i believe we'll have five which we're trying to fill that spot with derek of course <laughs> yeah. but you know who knows maybe we'll be able to add extra team members onto it so like i mean i i know it's possible so my team <laughs> we we had eight people right but we were only one half of the team they split my project into two different parts mm, we've so, actually discussed doing that yeah it it was helpful because we some of us only wanted to focus on certain aspects of the pro project mm -hmm. um so yeah but yeah, yeah so that I, might be a thing next semester yeah i would recommend <laughs> epics um one of the reasons i'm not is because i have 16 credits already and they're hard classes <laughs> But uh, I do see the value that the Epics brings, um, like especially if you don't have any internships, this helps a ton. Yeah, to, like, get you some really resumes. good experience and like good for your resume and mm -hmm. and that stuff. So especially if you are on a project from start to finish, it looks really yeah good. yeah. So that's why I'm trying to stick with it. Um, yeah. Hopefully no, it doesn't end because that. Well, I mean, I'll, okay, that sounds bad. <laughs> hopefully the issue is fixed, but. I think even if we fix that issue, I'd like to see the team actually transfer to a new area and try and combat pollution in that area. Yeah. So that the team does not end. Yeah. In that way. Well, not, and not <laughs> if you if you end up forming this nonprofit, then that's probably exactly what the mission will be is to like better air quality across the across these like basically hot spots of the world. Right. No, yeah, that would be really okay. cool. <laughs> um yeah is there any anything we missed um not that i know of i mean okay. there's more details i can go into like like i said i have two semesters worth of notes from research and everything <laughs> that i've gone through so like if anybody has any interest in hearing more about this before the website is up uh i don't know derek can put my like asu email or something in the description. yeah we can, can we can put some contact information in there um we can discuss more of the research and yeah. go more in depth so yeah no that would be good um and then just like every episode we like to give some recommendations for stuff that we found inspiring or something that was cool to us or something we learned um and so since we finished our semester. I made a goal of, um, you know, going through all the basics of Python programming language. And, you know, Code Academy is awesome. Uh, Coursera mm -hmm. is amazing. But a lot of times there are, like, there's a paywall. And right. I, I found this really great website called learnpython.org where, you know, it te it's just text, but it will teach you all the things you need. But then right below each text, there's a box where there's code that they have pre-written and you can run it. And in the box next to it, it will show you the output. So you can type like a, an example of the code they're talking about and run it. So you can immediately see how it works and you can kind of play with it and change around and ch like uh, do different things with it. And I don't know, I thought it was really cool and it's completely free. Um, free so is I'd, always good in my book. Yes. So. Especially for college students. Um, <laughs> So that would be my recommendation because I, I've been at it for about a week and a half now, and I'm a, almost halfway. But obviously, oh, I need okay, lots. That's of, pretty I good. Need, I need lots of practice. Um, right. But yeah, I've been going through, and um, I definitely need to revisit a few things. Like I just went over functions today, mm -hmm. and I'm too stuck in like the MATLAB way of thinking about functions that like it's kind of <laughs> handicapping my python so uh but anyway do you, um, do you yeah. prefer one over the other so um far? so i've only ever known matlab 
Mm, and I'm okay. just barely starting to learn Python. But the thing that appeals to me about Python is that there are big companies like NASA and Northrop that are starting to use Python more because their Python is a free programming language as opposed to MATLAB where you need these very expensive licenses, licenses to, to run mm -hmm. the program. So um, while I do like MATLAB and I like the interface and all that, I do see good things about Python that make it very interesting and very cool um, to use. So yeah, I'll have to use that resource. It's I haven't used Python since high school in my yeah. AP comp sci class. And we touched on it like very minimal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're using a lot, what is it, Scratch? We're using Scratch a lot. Oh, yeah, I've heard of Scratch. Those easy, like, plug-in mm -hmm. programs. It's like LabVIEW. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or uh, what's the different. other one? Um, Lego Mindstorm. Those, uh, did you ever do the code blocks? Yeah, code blocks. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, I just, the one thing I remember is, like, some Thanksgiving, like, Pong game that I made. <laughs> or that's cool. I don't even remember what it was. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. yeah, no, that's really interesting. I'm gonna have to look at that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, and you also have a recommendation. Sure. Um, clearly, I'm a bit of an energy nerd, <laughs> kind of my major. Um, so you know, it's been a thing for a while. But um, I was looking more into using like biofuel. Um, mm -hmm. and I was looking into the use of algae. Um, which I'm pretty sure is a thing that ASU researches because I know in one of the buildings yeah. there is like a whole wall based like discussing the research of it at least on the poly campus. Yeah, I I know I've seen an article about algae fuel and like biofuel stuff at ASU. So yeah, so I was I was looking into it more. It's just um, the the discussion of it basically. You know, you grow the algae, you end up starving it. Um, of all of its nutrients mm -hmm. so it ends up like building up sort of uh, fatty oil within it and then you use the addition of like some sort of substrate or something to break through the cell walls so it breaks and then all this this oil gets released mm -hmm. um, or like all the fats and sugars that were contained within it and everything um, and then you know you use a solvent to separate the fats and sugars you evaporate the solvent, um, you transform that into biodiesel, which can then be used for fueling cars, planes, mm -hmm. everything. Um, so I was just looking at that. Um, you know, it's horribly inefficient, horribly. <laughs> like that's the issue right now uh, that people are trying to solve is like, you know, the reason it's so inefficient is just the cost of it. Um, mm -hmm. however algae is more efficient than other plants because i think it was something but, like 60 percent more of it you can get you can get like 60 percent more oil from algae than other plants interesting like you're saying like soybeans or you know palm tree oil or whatever it is yeah um at least that's what i found i might be totally no wrong, that's so I'm so that's sorry. totally no that's fine <laughs> i these are just a uh, good thing i'll put the link to the the article you're talking about in the description but, um, yeah, there was a couple I was looking at, one on the DOE site. Mm -hmm. so. but yeah, no, I that was part of my EPICS project was they were trying to do some teacher at ASU invented a passive carbon capture system. Mm, okay. And so it's just basically like a big tree. Imagine that when air goes around it, it picks up um, CO2. And um, they were trying to work out a way to take that carbon that they were picking up and transform it back into a fuel for planes or cars or whatnot so they could be a not a green fuel but like a neutral like a like the carbon that they're taking out of the atmosphere is going to go right back into it but because it the fuel came from it's net zero yeah sorry yes. that's what i'm looking for it's a net zero <laughs> um but i i thought it was interesting because i'm like that's definitely technology we need even if it's just to transition to fully electric stuff. Right. So, no, that's cool. Um, and so, yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's all we have for you guys today. Um, I hope you guys liked the episode, that you learned some more things about the problems the world has and um, potentially how we can help. Um, 
And if you did like this episode, um, get in contact with me. I'll put you in contact with Sarah and her teammates and see if you guys uh, can find something that works. And um, again, you know, find us on social media and we'll catch you on the next one.